Merger and Acquisition. To take you through this topic is Mr. Cairo Magutu. We will look at uh, the syllabus as it is given by the examiner, that is CASNEP. And I want to give you the breakdown of, on what you, are of what you are supposed to cover. Then from there we can get into the details of each and every subtopic under the merger and acquisition. Under this topic, the first thing should be definition of merger and acquisition, uh, under which we will look at the classification of merger and acquisition. Then we look at the common motivation and demotivations behind merger and acquisition. We will also look at the EPS before the merger and acquisition and the post-acquisition EPS. We will also look at the relationship between merger motivation and type of mergers. Then we look at the contrast merger transaction characteristic by form of acquisition, method of payment, and attitude of target management. We also look at the pre-offer defense mechanism and post-offer takeover defense mechanism. Then from there, we look at the discounted cash flow analysis. We also look at computation of free cash flows for a target company. The next one, will, the next one is estimation of the value of the target company using corporate company and, uh, co comparable company and comparable transaction analysis. We also look at evaluation of takeover bid. The next one is effect of price and payment method to the, uh, to the distribution of risk and benefit in merger and acquisition transaction, then characteristics of merger and acquisition transaction that create value. And the last thing we need to cover under the merger and acquisition is transaction for uh, reasons for failed mergers. Now, to start with, we need to understand what merger and acquisition is. So the first thing here is merger and acquisition. So the topic is merger and acquisition. Under the topic merger and acquisition, we need to understand first what do we mean when we talk of merger, what it mean when we talk of acquisition. We must understand the definition of these two terms and actually what it mean when we say that two or more farms merged together or a farm acquired another farm. To, uh, to begin with, we understand what merger is. The merger, this is a combination of two or more farms where the identity of each farm disappears after the acquisition. Simply, in a merger, if you have a company A, you combine it with another company B, you get a company C. The identity of the two farms that are being combined together disappears after the, uh, after the merger. So simply, merger is a combination of two or more farms after which the identity of the two farms that are merging disappears and a completely new farm is formed. That is merger. The next one, we talk of acquisition. In an acquisition, also known as the takeover bid, it means that two farms come together, but the identity of one farm dominates the other farm. When two farms come together, there is that farm that will retain its identity. So simply, we can say that if we have a farm A that has come together with a farm B, we will get a farm A. So it is a farm A that acquired farm B. So the identity that disappears is for the farm that is being acquired. The farm that acquires another farm is known as a predator. The farm that is being acquired is known as the target. So when a company acquires the other farm, the identity of the predator is retained. The identity of the target disappears. That is an acquisition, uh, an acquisition or uh, actually an acquisition in, uh, in a, where businesses combine together. Then, of course, we've understood what merger is. Now, having understood 
what merger is and what acquisition is, we need to look at the classification of merger and acquisition. Classification of merger and acquisition. For the purpose of this topic, that is merger and acquisition, we'll be using merger and acquisition interchangeably for all purpose as if they mean the same. So you find that a question on merger or a question on acquisition will be tested the same way. So we need to understand the type or the way mergers and acquisitions are. The first one, we talk of horizontal merger or acquisition. The horizontal merger. Number two, we talk of vertical merger or acquisition. And the third one, we talk of conglomerate merger or acquisition. So in the classification of merger and acquisition, there is horizontal merger and acquisition. There is vertical merger and acquisition. There is conglomerate merger and acquisition. To start with, let us start with the horizontal merger or acquisition. What do we mean when we talk of the horizontal merger and acquisition? In this case, two firms are combined together and these two firms are in the same level of business. For example, we can have two banks combining together. They are at the same level of activity. So if we have a bank A, you add a bank B, you will have one entity. In a horizontal merger, it is simply a combination of two or more firms that are at the same level of activity. That is the horizontal merger. The main objective or purpose for a horizontal merger is to ensure that there is increase in market share. As a result, the firm will enjoy the economies of scale. So when we have the horizontal merger, the services or the goods offered by the, comp the, the merging company is the same. So as a result of that, the two firms becomes one big entity offering the same, uh, offering the, the same services and similar goods. So they enjoy the economies of scale. Number two, we talk of the vertical merger or acquisition. In a vertical merger or acquisition, this is where two entities at different level of activities combine together to form a completely new entity. For example, if you have one entity X, there is another entity Y, the output, output of entity Y is an input, input for entity X. That is a vertical merger. Two firms which may be in the same industry, but one firm's output is an input for the other firm. In such a case, when the two firms come together, we say that it is a vertical merger. The vertical merger in this case ensures that the output of one firm will be an input of the other firm, and as a result, there is a ready market for the output for the one firm. The other thing is that the firm whose input is an output of the other firm is guaranteed of the supply of the input. So the major uh, objective of vertical merger is that there is creation or provision of market for, the, for one firm's output. And again, on the other end, there is a guarantee supply of input for the other firm. Then we have the other type of merger, number three. This is what we call the conglomerate merger. In a conglomerate merger, 
This is where two or more firms in completely different industries come together to form a new firm. You have a firm A and a firm B. You combine them together, but they are in different industry. For example, this firm may be in manufacturing and this one is in communication. Or you have one firm in communication industry or the other one is in the banking industry. When you look at the two firms, they are not, they are not related. They are in different industries. They offer different goods and different services. When such a combination occurs, we talk of conglomerate merger or acquisition. And what is the main objective? What is the main reason for conglomerate merger? The main objective for conglomerate merger is to ensure that there is risk diversification. And the risk diversification is usually achieved when the correlation between the returns of the two firms, that is the correlation between the returns of the two firms, is negative, such that when one firm is generating income, the other one may not be generating income. When one firm performance is low, the other firm's performance is high. In such a case, it guarantees the investor continued income throughout the year. So we talk of the conglomerate merger with an objective of risk diversification, and it is achieved when the correlation coefficient between the returns of the two, uh, of the two firms are negative. So we having understood that, what merger and acquisition is, we have the types of merger, the horizontal merger. We say that two firms at the same level of activity combines together to form a completely new entity. Vertical merger, this is where we have two firms which may be in the same industry, but they are in di at a different level of activity. A good example, we can have a car assembling company acquiring a tire manufacturing firm. A car assembling firm requires the output of a tire manufacturing firm as its input. That makes uh, the combination a vertical merger. The output of one firm is an input of the other firm. The other one is the conglomerate merger. We say that it is a combination of two or more firms in different industries with an objective of risk diversification. So that is the general overview or understanding of what merger and acquisition is. Now, when you talk of the merger and acquisition, a very important concept we need to understand is that when firms are coming together, each firm has its shareholders. They are all the owners in each firm. For a firm, for a firm shareholders to release their ownership and they join the other firm, there must be some consideration. Simply, if a firm X want to acquire a firm Y, this X, the acquiring, we said is a predator. The firm being acquired, that is firm Y, we said is a target. When this firm predator is acquiring the target, the shareholders in the target must be compensated to forego their ownership in firm Y so that they can become either shareholders in firm X or they can go, they are paid, they leave their ownership. Now, how do we get the forms of consideration? How are the, uh, the shareholders in the target firm compensated to forego their ownership? There are various forms of consideration, and the most common ones are, number one is cash consideration. Cash consideration. Number two, we have share for share exchange. Share for share exchange. Number three, we talk of issue 
of convertible securities. The issue of convertible securities. And the fourth one, we talk of a combination. A combination of any two or the three above forms. So a combination of any two or the three above forms, that means we can have partial consideration in cash and issue of shares or cash and issue of convertible securities or issue shares and partially convertible securities or a combination of the three where the shareholders in the target are paid cash, they are issued with some shares, they are issued with convertible securities. So the forms of consideration, we need to understand what are the implications of cash consideration, the implication of share for share exchange, the implication of issue of convertible securities as form of consideration in a merger and acquisition. I want us to start with the cash consideration. We see what are the implications when the shareholders of the target firm are paid in cash. That is cash consideration. Now, let's start with that one. We say number one, cash consideration. The cash consideration. Now, when it comes to the cash consideration, it means that if a firm X want to acquire a firm Y, this is the predator and this is the target. The predator want to acquire the target. There are shareholders in this firm Y, the shareholders in the target firm, and there are shareholders in firm X. When making a decision to acquire and they agree that the shareholders in Y will be paid in form of cash, it means the predator firm will purchase the ownership in Y and the shareholders or the owners in Y will be paid in cash. They forgo their ownership. So what is the implication of that? Number one, there is huge cash outflow huge cash outflow from the predator huge cash outflow from the predator which may cause liquidity charges in the predator entity number two is that there is no dilution and control of ownership in the predator. We talk of no dilution or uh, no dilution in ownership and control of the predator entity. The shares or the shareholders in the predator entity will retain their control or their ownership in the farm because the shareholders of the target company will be paid in cash and they will leave their interest in the investment. The other one, number three, no change in gearing of the, of the predator farm. The gearing level does not change. This is because there is no issue of debt. There is no change in the equity level. There is no change in the debt level of the predator farm. So as a result, when the shareholders in the target are paid, there, there will be no change in the amount of equity and the, in the amount of debt. The other one, number four, is that the shareholders in the target are paid and using the proceeds, they can invest in risk-free securities. The investment in farm Y may be considered risky. When the shareholders in Y are paid, that is in the target entity are paid, they can use the proceeds 
to move from a risk venture to a risk free to risk free securities that is use the proceeds and invest them in the in the government securities the other one number 5 is that there is no transaction cost no transaction cost means that unlike the issue on sale of shares in the market where a shareholder will go to the market and try to sell the shares under merger and acquisition where shareholders are paid in cash they do not incur transaction cost so simply these are the implications of cash consideration when an entity target shareholders are paid in cash now we look at the next form of consideration and we've talked of share for share exchange or well, before we look at the share for share exchange i would want us to start with issue of convertible securities the issue of convertible securities now what do we mean by issue of convertible securities number two this is issue of convertible securities now the convertible securities this is where the shareholders in the target are issued by some securities from the predator entity the shareholders in the target entity will forego their equity in this firm and they are given securities like debentures like preference shares like loan stock such that after the merger and uh, after the merger or acquisition the shareholders in the target becomes lenders in the uh, in the predator so they they are entitled to preference dividend at the end of the year they are entitled to interest at the end of the year in case they are issued with the preference shares they will be paid preference dividend in case they are issued with the loan stock or the bengers or any other form of debt that attract interest they will be paid interest at the end of the financial period so the target shareholders no longer becomes shareholders in the predator they become lenders in the predator so they continue as investors in the predator entity but at a different level as compared to what they were before the merger and acquisition now what are the implications of this form of consideration that is when the shareholders in a firm being acquired are issued with the debentures or they are issued with the preference shares the first one is that it increases the gearing ratio in the predator farm when a predator issued debentures or preference shares to the shareholders in the target the gearing or the level of debt in the predator farm increases it therefore increases or raises the financial risk in the predator entity that is implication number 1 implication number 2 there is no dilution in ownership and control no dilution in ownership and control of the predator farm this is because the shares in the predator will not change after the merger and acquisition they retain their shares at the same level so there is no dilution in ownership and control the shareholders in the predator retains their ownership in that farm no change in the ordinary share capital structure the other one number three it conserve cash for predator this form of consideration will conserve cash for predator this is because no cash payment that is done to the target so the cash is retained in the predator and the predator cannot experience any liquidity charges after the merger and acquisition as a result the firm will have 
stability in cash flow. The other one, number four, is that the predator enjoys interest tax shield benefit. The predator, if the predator issued debentures, loan stock to the shareholders in the target, the predator will pay interest at the end of the year. Such interest is allowable for tax purposes. To that end, the predator company will enjoy interest tax shield, interest tax shield, which is equivalent to interest per annum times tax rate. So the predator will enjoy interest tax shield, which is a benefit to the firm because interest is allowable for tax purposes, unlike the dividends that are payable by a company to its shareholders. The interest is allowable. Now, when you look at this, they are the, the implications of issue of convertible securities. Now, the other one we need to look at, we need to look at the share for share exchange. This is very common in most firms. And when you talk of the share for share exchange, we need to understand it in a very detailed way. And that is what I want us to look at. And this is number three. Number three, this is share for share exchange. The share for share exchange. A share for share exchange arises when a predator company issues some shares to the shareholders in the target in exchange for the shares held by the shareholders in the target. <coughs> at this point, we look at the predator acquiring another entity, the target. The predator will issue its shares to the shareholders in the target. So the shareholders in the target becomes a part of the owners in the predator. Before we look at how to go about the share for share exchange, we can look at the implication of this approach of consideration in a merger and acquisition. The implication number one, there is, there is dilution in ownership and control of predator firm. The predator will issue new shares to shareholders in the target. So the number of shares in the predator increases, more shareholders are brought into the predator company. So as a result of that, the ownership is diluted and the control is diluted in the predator entity. Number two is that it lowers the gearing. It lowers the gearing ratio. That means the amount of equity in the predator increases with the debt remaining constant. So it lowers the gearing ratio in the predator entity. At the same time, it reduces the financial risk in the predator entity. Number three, it conserves cash to predator entity. It conserves cash to predator entity. That means that the predator entity is not likely to suffer liquidity charges after the merger and acquisition where shareholders in the target are issued with the shares and they, bec they become shareholders in the predator entity. So the cash in the predator is retained in the predator. There is no charges or there are no charges in the liquidity of the predator. Now, having understood this, there are some other aspects of merger and acquisition that we need to understand, especially when you talk of the share for share exchange. In any arrangement of merger and acquisition, there must be an agreement on 
exchange ratio. An exchange ratio is determined based on the market price per share for the shares in the predator entity and the shares in the target entity. So the first thing we need to understand under merger and acquisition, we need to understand what is exchange ratio. How many shares should be issued by the predator for how many shares in the target? We say that exchange ratio is equal to the offer price. Price by predator over market price per share of predator. The offer price by the predator, this is the amount the predator company is willing to pay for every share held by a shareholder in the target entity. You divide by the market price per share of the shares in the predator company. The price at which the shares in the predator company are trading in the market. So we determine an exchange ratio. That one must be determined. The other thing that must be considered when uh, a firm is acquiring another firm or in case of a merger is that number two, the farms in uh, the shareholders in the two farms may get into, uh, into an agreement or they, they may arrive into an exchange ratio that will guarantee them an EPS similar to what it was before the merger and acquisition. And this is called the non-dilutive exchange ratio. ratio. A non-dilutive exchange ratio, it is an exchange ratio that will ensure that the EPS for the target shareholders and the EPS for the predator shareholders will not change or they will get the same EPS as it was before the merger and acquisition, even after the merger and acquisition. So the non-dilutive exchange ratio is given by non-dilutive offer price, price, you divide by the market price per share of predator. The non-dilutive offer price divided by the market price per share of the predator or it is given by the earnings per share in target before merger. Before merger divided by the EPS in predator before Merger. The non-dilutive exchange ratio is determined by determining non-dilutive offer price. An offer price that the shareholders in the predator are willing to pay for a share in the target without diluting the EPS divided by the market price per share of the predator or in the pre uh, of the predator shares. The other way of getting a non-dilutive exchange ratio is you get the earnings per share in the predator company, in the target company, you divide by the earnings per share in the predator company before the merger or acquisition. Now, how do we get the non-dilutive offer price? Non-dilutive offer price is based on the price earnings, uh, price earnings ratio in the predator and the EPS of the target. So we say that non-dilutive offer price is equal to price earnings ratio, ratio in predator, that is predator company, multiplied by the EPS in target. 
both before the acquisition. So we need the non-dilutive offer price that will help us get non-dilutive exchange ratio. The non-dilutive offer price is given by the earnings per share in the predator multiplied by the earnings per share in the target entity. So either using this approach or the second approach where we have the EPS in the target before the merger over EPS in predator before the merger, you will get a non-dilutive exchange ratio. And this is an exchange ratio that guarantees the shareholders in both companies an EPS equivalent to what they were earning before the merger and acquisition. Now, this EPS we are talking about is the EPS after merger and acquisition and which is known as number three, the post acquisition EPS. The acquisition after the merger and acquisition uh, after the merger and acquisition. So how do we get that EPS? After the two firms have come together, they will form a completely new entity. And this completely new entity will have shareholders, those in the predator before the merger, and the new shareholders after the merger in case of share for share exchange. In case of other forms of consideration, the, the shares in the predator before the merger and acquisition will remain constant even after the merger and acquisition. So to get to the post acquisition earnings per share, we say that this is equal to the combined earnings to ordinary shareholders. In the, that is, earnings, the combined earnings to ordinary shareholders for the predator plus the earnings to ordinary shareholders in the target. This one you divide by the number of ordinary shares in predator before merger or the acquisition. This we add new shares issued to shareholders in target. In case of merger and acquisition, where shareholders in the target entity are issued with the new shares, the new shares are added to the shares in the predator before the merger and acquisition to form the total shares in the predator after the merger. So when you take the combined earnings, that is the earnings to ordinary shareholders in the predator plus earnings to ordinary shareholders in the target, you divide by the total shares after the merger and acquisition, that gives the post-acquisition EPS. So if the non-dilutive exchange ratio was used in, the in that merger and acquisition, the EPS after the acquisition that we resort here will, uh, will be equivalent to the EPS in the predator before the merger and acquisition. Now, for the shareholders in the target, the comparable EPS, that is, that which the shareholder can take as EPS to compare with what they were earning before the merger and acquisition is given by, we say that this is number five, number four, we call it comparable. Comparable post acquisition EPS to target shareholders. That which a shareholder in the target company will take and compare with what they were earning in the in the company before the acquisition is the comparable post acquisition EPS to the target shareholders. How do we get this? It is given by the exchange ratio, exchange ratio multiplied by the post acquisition earnings per share. The exchange ratio 
that helped the firms to determine what consideration to be paid, multiplied by the post acquisition EPS, which is this one, will enable a shareholder in the target to determine the EPS that they can compare with what they were earning or what the EPS was before the merger and acquisition. So these are very important items to understand when it comes to merger and acquisition. Number one, what is exchange ratio? Number two, what is non-dilutive exchange ratio? Number three, what is post-acquisition earnings per share? Number four, how do we get the comparable post-acquisition EPS to target shareholders? Having understood this, comfortably you can answer a question on computation in relation to merger and acquisition. So as we continue with this, or as we look at the further aspects of merger and acquisition, we will look at a question, at a comprehensive question that captures all this. And we need to clearly understand and always remember these formulas for the purpose of examination. So for today, we shall stop there. I believe we'll continue revising. Make sure that you understand all that you have done today so that when we meet next time, we'll be able to attempt a question in relation to the merger and acquisition, we see the various way an examiner can test under this aspect before we can move to the other part of merger and acquisition. So for now, we shall stop there. I believe you will continue doing your revision. I wish you well. We meet next time. God bless you so much. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to get yourself a copy of our professionally prepared study text and revision partners. Visit our shop along Tom Boyer Street, Pioneer House, third floor, opposite fire station. Thank you for attending our study session. Welcome to our today's session. In today's session, we are still dwelling on the introduction to the derivative market and instruments. In our prior lesson, we learned the introduction element where we saw a derivative being a contract and a contract in which it derives its value from another asset. This other asset, we are calling it what? An underlying. This underlying can be a bond, can be a share, can be a currency or a commodity. We have seen the introduction bit of the types of uh, forward, um, the types of derivative instruments. They were one, the forward commitments. In the forward commitments, we have looked at two. One was the future contract, futures contract, and the forward contracts. In the forward contracts, we have seen they trade under the OTC and 